Well, hello. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Recovery Alive. You guys are welcome to stand up with us. Stand on up. Uh, get a good stretch. <laughs> it's good to be together today. Man, God is good. He's here. He's got a plan for today. You guys are in the back. You're welcome to join us if you like. We're going to sing some songs. Going to wake ourselves up, get our hearts right, get our minds in the right place as we celebrate God and all he's doing. Would you guys service today? God, we know that you're here. Lord, we know that you're with us. God, you were so kind for waking us up this morning, God. We thank you for the breath in our lungs. We thank you for opening our eyes, for protecting us and getting us here. There's something amazing in store for today, Lord, so help us to be brave enough just to open our hearts to receive what you have to say. Lord, we want to be listeners who hear from you. God, we know that you're working, you're fighting for us every day. God, thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When all I see is the battle, you see the victory. I see is the mountain you see the mountain moved and as I walk through the shadows your love surrounds me and there's nothing to fear now for I am safe with you So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high And oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I'll lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Yes it does And if you are for me, who can be against me? Oh, for Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. Oh, and all I see are these ashes. You see. God, you see the empty tomb. Yes, you do, Lord. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. And oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I'll lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Yeah. Oh, mighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Hey, 
so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. And oh God, the battle below, yes it does. Oh, in every fear, I'll lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. Yeah. <laughs> Every fear. I'm going to lay at the feet of Jesus. Singing that today, it's a little tough for me, I think, <laughs> because I woke up with fear. And I sing this, I sing this song all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm in this room every day singing songs like this, but I woke up with fear. And I don't think that the answer to that is just to ignore it to pretend. I don't think it's healthy to come into a place like this and for me to get, say, God, because I have a microphone, then I don't have any fear. Or because I'm in church, that means I believe everything. Or because I'm standing and singing a song, that means that all my problems are going to go away. So what we need to do is, rather than come in with a spirit of complacency, we come in with a spirit of of expectation because grace is just about saying God I'm not okay but help is available the help is available for us today I don't want to be familiar treat it like it doesn't matter I don't want to lose the wonder of your presence I don't want to come inside oh just want to run in like a child Caught up in the joy and wonder of your presence And I am coming back to first love Coming back to Jesus Coming back to you Suddenly the room is shifting I'm finding it again The wonder of your presence I never want to leave communion Just want to be where you're moving Caught up in the joy and wonder of your presence You're right here, Lord And I am coming back to first love coming back to Jesus coming back to you oh, oh and no more going through these emotions you're my one devotion I'm oh, coming back to you coming back oh and I am coming back to first love coming back to Jesus coming back to you no more going through the motions you're my one devotion God I'm coming back to you oh it's nothing 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 matters more to me you're all more to me you're all I need nothing matters. yeah oh nothing 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 matters more to me you're all I 
nothing matters more nothing 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 matters more to me is your all i need lord and i coming back to first love coming back to jesus coming back to you no more going through the motions you're my one devotion i'm coming back to you god you are all we need you are all i need lord god the things that we're holding on to the things that we think we need more than you god help us to put those things down today in jesus name God, to find the freedom in Jesus, the freedom that can only come through Jesus, Lord. That's what we're here to do, Lord. That is why we're really here, is to seek Jesus, to seek freedom, to seek a new beginning, a fresh start, to find that new mercy that you're offering today. Because nothing else, nothing else matters, Lord. So we come seeking you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, y'all. All right, guys, take a second, greet each other, say hi, give someone a hug, and then we'll continue with our stuff. How you doing on a Wednesday at noon? Everybody doing all right? Welcome to Recovery Live on a Wednesday. Welcome online, everybody. Hey, turn around and wave at everybody. Say, hey, what's up, online people? We love that you guys are here. Thanks for hanging out with us. Karen Reese, thank you for all that you do online. My name is John. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. And uh, I have been delivered from alcohol abuse and, I, uh, and suicidality and all that stuff, you know. Don't even think about it. Don't, don't, I don't mess with that stuff. But I'm still working through some things. I'm getting much better in my codependency. Um, that, there's a lot of victory there. And now I'm kind of I'm kind of working on this thing. It's an interesting thing called uh, imposter syndrome. Sometimes I feel like I don't belong, and that I'm, I'm I don't know that that uh, God should have chose someone else. That kind of stuff. Anybody struggle with some of that stuff? Yeah. And so, but but uh, recovery. The 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 people in recovery remind me. Who I am in Christ, uh, the power of God reminds me of who I am in, in Him, and the process keeps me in a place where I continue to self-evaluate and I just kick all those lies out. Amen. I hope you're doing the same thing. Power people process of the Christ Center 12 Steps. That's what we're all about here. So so glad that you guys are here. We prioritize the power of the Holy Spirit to do what we cannot do on our own, and that's the emphasis. If you're watching online, or if you're here, and this might be your first time, or you've been here a few times. Keep pressing in to the power of Jesus Christ. And um, I white knuckled for a long time. It just doesn't work. We're going to be hearing a great story of somebody whose life was redeemed. I imagine Jim's uh, guy who tried a little white knuckling didn't work out so well. Uh, he's going to be coming up here. Um, we are on step eight, the power of ownership, Jim. We're on the power of ownership. And everybody take a look at this step right here. Are you guys ready? Power of ownership. We made direct amends to all persons we've harm unless you do so to injure them or others romans 12 18 will y'all read this with me do all that you can to live in peace with everyone does it say you have to live at peace with everyone well we we don't have we can only clean our side of the street is that is that right we can only handle our side of the street that's what we're responsible for so as much as it's possible we live at peace with all people um, on our side of the street so uh, I am super excited about Jim coming to share 
uh, while he's sharing, I want you to be thinking about this core question. And uh, I know, like, repentance is something that has been well defined in the church. To repent gives this thought process. The Greek is metanoia. Metanoia. Meta change. Noia is your mind. It's to have a change of mind. It's to literally turn, it's to have a change, but not physically. It's a change of mind. And the way I like to think about it is the turn is not to necessarily just turn from our sin. It's to take our focus off our sin and focus it on Christ. It's not what we're turning from that's important. It's who we're turning to that's important. Amen? You guys awake today? You should get an amen for that one. Right. I'm going to say it again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not what we're turning from that's important. It's who we're turning to that's important. Amen? Yeah. yeah. They're full of pizza. What can you do? All right. That's the best thing to do. And Jim is a guy who's had a complete change of heart and mind. Uh, we were just talking, and he's just like, it's been a long time coming. But, man, it's here. We see a man who's been transformed. His life's been changed. He's going to tell you about it. Can you guys get excited about Jim as he comes to share his story today? Come on, Jim. All right. Amen, amen. And it sounds like the microphone's on. That's a good thing. Um, I want to give a quick shout-out to the production team. I volunteer here every, uh, almost every Friday night. Uh, thanks for uh, making me sound and look good today. So. <laughs> All right, well, um, let's, let's pray to start our time today. God, you know our hearts, our struggles, and the demons that chase us. Quiet the distractions, give us peace, protect us from the evil one. Let us hear and recognize your truth. Prick the hearts of those of us that need to be delivered from the chains and bondage that are holding us back. Somehow, some way, through the music, scripture, and testimony, set one more person free. Save at least one more person's life today. Their marriage, their family, and their eternal future. God, we love you. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, to pay the price for our sins. God, help us claim that gift of freedom today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm Jim. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. Through Christian counseling, Recovery Alive, Reboot Trauma, and Military, and three process groups, God has delivered me from fear, shame, and condemnation. God is still working on me, some hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I'm experiencing victory over, over a pornography addiction. I still struggle with anxiety and negative coping mechanisms like escapism and isolation that I use to soothe my self-worth wounds. But Jesus is bringing healing. So how did I become a part of Recovery Alive? John twisted my arm. <laughs> no, I had reached a new low. My pornography addiction was wrecking my marriage and the other relationships that were around me. I thought I was broken and defective, and I was looking for hope. I needed recovery, chapter 8, step 8, even though I didn't even know what it was. Chapter 8 is the power of ownership, and step 8, eight asks us to direct amends to all persons we have harmed unless to do so would injure them or others. Romans 12, 18 says, It's possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone peace with everyone. I needed reconciliation with my wife. My wife had caught me with pornography yet again. I've never seen her so brokenhearted. She pleaded with me to get help, and I was afraid if I didn't, there might be irreversible consequences to my marriage and my family. I knew that I needed to make amends with my wife, but true repentance for my sins do to the broken trust that a pornography addiction had caused seemed out of reach. But Jesus is the master carpenter. He has the tools to repair a damaged family, a damaged life, a broken relationship, and restore that marriage. Jesus opened his toolbox and has been putting my life together again for the past three years. When I started attending RA, I thought I was seeking help to overcome a pornography addiction, but instead, I found that porn was just one of several coping mechanisms hiding deep self-worth wounds. I knew I would be writing a letter of amends to my wife, but before I could seek amends, I needed to learn how to forgive myself. Working the process, I discovered that full amends meant it's not a simple apology. It goes beyond theory, thought, or feelings. And John Eklund writes, 
that offering amends means we must walk out our I'm sorry to the fullest extent. That means you're admitting without excuses our wrong, emphasizing verbally to our best ability with the one we hurt, considering how much it must have made that person feel, considering how much it must have impacted their life. And amends is not asking for forgiveness as a request for something that we want or deserve, but it's an admission of guilt, regardless of whether they accept it, empathize with us, validate it, or even receive our apology. And it's freely given. No strings attached. No conditions. Working through my inventory list, how fun, I discovered I hurt other people besides my wife. I was also harboring bitterness towards God, and I would owe him amends too. So as I begin my story, think about today's core question. Do you owe God an amends? If so, how would you offer amends to God? So a little background before I get too far ahead of myself. After all, what's a good redemption story without a good backstory and some background music? God has always spoke to me, spoken to me in a special way through music, and when I started my first process group in June 2021, God marked my journey with a song that had just been released. <sighs> Evidence by Josh Baldwin, written by Josh Baldwin, Ed Cash, and Ethan Hulse. In verse 1, all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storm made way for spring in every season and where I'm standing. I see. I see, the I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises of fulfillment all over my life, all over my life, all throughout my history. That lyric, man. God was reminding me of the landmark moments he used to shape my life. Looking back through my spiritual rearview mirror, I can see the evidence of God working in my life. Recalling moments like when I was asked Jesus as my Savior when I was just four years old. That's 50 years ago, which is really weird because I'm only 25. But coming to Christ at such a young age made me different. And I was a good kid. I was friendly and trustworthy and honest and practically a Boy Scout. You know, a living life by rules like look both ways before you cross the street. Don't cheat off your neighbor's homework. And here's a good one. Don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go out with girls that do. There's your next RA t-shirt. <laughs> but as I grew older, some of my classmates treated me differently. Teasing and bullying started. It rattled the foundations of my self-worth and challenged my value in Christ. My Kmart clothes weren't preppy enough, and I wasn't cool enough to be in the in crowd. My grades were just high enough that I was labeled a nerd, and thank you, Huey Lewis and the news, it was not hip to be square. And uh, nerds did not get the girls. And it gets better. I was literally a choir boy. I sang first tenor in my middle school, high school, and church choirs. When I auditioned for my middle school, middle school choir, uh, I had to sing scales so that our director could gauge my vocal range. Well, my voice hadn't changed yet, and I naturally slipped into falsetto, hitting high notes that even most of the sopranos couldn't hit. Picture the Vienna Boys Choir, yeah. The entire class erupted into laughter before the choir director stopped me. And I didn't play football, I played the cello. I had no interest in sports. I loved music and drama. I watched cartoons and still do. Um, and I love superheroes and sci-fi. Now keep in mind, this is the 1980s. Uh, even though Star Wars movies were in theaters, and yes, the original trilogy is still the best. Amen. That's right. <laughs> being, <laughs> being into sci-fi was not cool. I found that adults would give me positive attention when I was smart in class, showed strong Bible knowledge in Sunday school, and performed well in music and on stage. People-pleasing and perfectionism became regular habits to get me more positive attention and fill the void in my self-worth. As good of a kid I was, 
I was also turning to negative coping mechanisms like porn to escape and feel better about myself. I had great friends, but never a girlfriend. More and more, the name-calling, snickers, and bullying started speaking louder to me than any positive attention I could ever get. Negative self-talk resounded in my head. Over and over again, I would hear, You're not valuable. You're not lovable. Even though I came from a caring family and a Christian home, my young Christian theology was skewed. The church I grew up in spoke about God's grace, but talk, taught legalistic views. Merriam Webster's dictionary defines legalism as strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or a religious or moral code. Adherence to the law. That sounds a lot like the perfectionism that I was adopting. This is exactly what Jesus criticized the Pharisees and Sadducees about. Listen to Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4. When Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit at Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you to, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulder, shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. I was carrying the heavy burden of a perfect choir boy persona on the outside, but on the inside I was in spiritual turmoil. I was concealing my sin from others, but not from God. I knew my righteousness did not meet God's standards. I used Jesus as a fire escape, Forgive me when I asked, but, when I, but then I wasn't really looking at true repentance or behavior change. I wasn't really being a good boy. Most days we think of ourselves as good. We point out sins and flaws in others, but we are happy to minimize our own sins. At least that's what I was doing. The Bible reminds, of us, reminds us of our imperfect state in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. And again in Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standards. I didn't age out of my character defects. They began to take root as I grew and as I stepped into the wild world. I joined the Navy after graduating high school. Enter United States Navy Boot Camp, Orlando, Florida, October 1987. I quickly learned I'd been living a sheltered life at home, protected from the world. Although I developed good friendships, I found myself surrounded in an environment with alcohol, profanity, pornography, promiscuity, and all the world that could offer an 18-year-old U.S. Navy sailor. People pray. Pray for our military men and women. Not only do they face a level of trauma that no human being should ever experience, they are also exposed to an evil and a battle for their minds and souls. They're not just in physical harm's way. Satan wants their hearts, whether they were raised with Christian values or not. Praise the Lord that he wants them more. So fast forward to Naval Training School. My friends were making some plans to go out that night. There was a place where good boys shouldn't go. Wouldn't it be fun to bring Jim along? They threatened to tie me up and drag me with them, whether I agreed to go or not. To this day, I wish I could say that they had to tie me up and drag me, but I willingly said yes, and I went along. The world offers a lot of tempting thrills, that night, some of my friends' fun was at my expense. That momentary fun led to insane regret. The Holy Spirit literally quaked inside my body. I did not make my next right decision that night. But God, here's that song again, Evidence. Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. 
You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. We read in Romans 8, 28, For we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. In my spiritual rearview mirror, I can see that God used my poor decision to reach me. I was literally standing at a crossroads. Follow the world and live like every sailor does, wine, women, and song, or follow Jesus. I chose Jesus. As pivotal of a crossroads that decision was, that poor decision haunted me. I added it to my growing list of sins I would easily confess, but couldn't forgive myself for. My skewed, legalistic view of Christianity still didn't align to the life that I was living. I had an outspoken Jesus testimony on the outside, but on the inside, my hidden sin was causing spiritual conflict. Both the devil and my conscience kept pointing out my imperfection. By not seeking true repentance and behavior change, my wound fell nation. My worth wounds only grew deeper when I almost flunked out of machinist mate A school. Even worse, I did fail out of nuclear engineering power school. That's another story for another day that God used. As hard as I tried to live up to my own high standards, I missed the mark. I was a failure of a sailor, and I was going to get shipped out to the fleet on an aircraft carrier. Did you know that there's only two types of ships in the world? Submarines and targets. I'm supposed to laugh there, it's all right. Yeah. So an aircraft carrier is a floating city. That was not for me. Instead, I volunteered for the Navy submarine force. I figured submarines had better food, you know, steak and lobster every day. Submarines were definitely air-conditioned. On a surface ship in the engine room, it can reach over 110 degrees on a regular basis. I would soon find out that submarine sailors don't feel just the sea pressure. There's a pressure to perform at your very best all the time. You're always on high alert, and submariners persevere and are resilient. For six years, I learned how to just white-knuckle and push through it. Persevere and you'll come out just fine on the, other, on the other side no matter what the trial was. So that became my take on life. Keep hiding my character defects, stay perfect on the outside, perseverance will see me through, with the occasional God get me out of this one prayer. With the white knuckle grip, I would control my life, my outcomes, and hide my sin from others. But it was all a lie. Did I mention that submarine sailors use coffee, sarcasm and hazing to combat boredom. I mean to the, combat the stress out at sea. I can ne neither confirm nor deny that I was duct taped to a large valve hanging from the overhead in the machinery room with a flashlight taped in an extremely awkward position. I can neither confirm nor deny that I may have mouthed off to the wrong person at the wrong time, causing such an incident to happen. It's easy to laugh at that story now, probably because I deserved it. But other incidents trigger trauma and pain, more worth wounds, creating more questions. Why, God, why is this happening to me? And why won't the bullies stop? In the Navy, I had good days, like meeting one of my best Christian friends ever, John Johnson. We were like James and John in the Bible, the sons of Zebedee. There was also... I was the maneuvering watch lookout, binoculars in hand, while we were transiting on the surface, entering the Mediterranean Sea. The sun on my face and the sea breeze blowing in the air. To the left of the port side, the coast of Spain suddenly appeared. On the right, or my starboard side, the coast of Morocco, Africa. And right there in front of me, Moroccan fishermen, in the same kind of wooden boats, Casting the same type of fishing nets that Peter, James, and John did back in Jesus' day. Amazing. I also met my wife, Jennifer, because of the Navy. All good days. Then there was my worst day. I, uh, I rarely share this story. 
it's difficult to retell because I relive the trauma. It reveals the dark depths that my heart and my mind can reach, but it's still part of my redemption story, so I share it now. October, the USS Dallas. Yes, that was actually the ship that I served on. But not as glamorous as Hollywood movies. We were on special deployment, and I was standing watch in the submarine's control room, actually driving the ship. I was sitting between the chief of the watch, who was my, um, uh, my first-class pedagogy. There was the diving officer of the watch, which was my senior chief, or my supervisor's boss. There was the helm steers the ship, has some minor depth control, but uh, steers the ship's rudder, and then my station. I was the stern planesman, managing major, major ship's depth changes, certainly greater than 200 feet. I wasn't actually supposed to be there. I was a senior member of the crew, standing at junior watch station, but again, that's another story for another day. I don't remember exactly what was said, But it was far more than typical sub-sailor sarcasm and teasing. Negative comment after negative comment, criticizing me, my Christianity, and berating me. To this day, I've never experienced anything like it. At that moment, I wanted to force the stern planes down at such a deep angle holding them with the force of my body, the sub would dive straight down to the bottom of the ocean. I was belted in my seat. It would be hard for anyone to pull me away. I'd take them and the whole crew down with me. This good boy, this choir boy, with an outspoken Jesus testimony, in that moment was capable of mass murder. It's hard to reconcile and justify those thoughts, even as I tell the story now. But it happened. That's how I felt and reacted. I was willing to end the lives of 100 sailors just for the words of two men. It's difficult to describe the anger, frustration, helplessness, and the level of despair that I felt. I sat there and weighed the consequences in my head. I was literally on the brink. It was like all the years of bullying and persecution culminated into one hate-filled moment. But God, the Lord intervened and brought me to my senses. In hot, flaming, angry words, almost in someone else's voice, I spoke. I need to be relieved. What? Even hotter, even angrier, I need to be relieved. They called another watchstander to relieve me, and I left the control room to find a quiet space alone to decompress, which is very hard to do on a submarine, by the way. In tears, I had a long talk with God. God, why? Why would you let this happen? Instantly, God reminded me of my prayer request I had asked him just the day before. God, do you want me to re-enlist? Should I stay in the Navy as a career, or should I get out and go to college? <laughs> oh, he definitely answered my prayer that day. There's that song again, Evidence. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. I see your promises of fulfillment all over my life. Not only did God answer my prayer with my worst U.S. Navy experience, but I had a surprise when I returned to port after the deployment. I called my parents to check in, and I found out that my dad, <laughs> that exact day, that exact hour, my dad was praying for me. God led my dad to pray for me in my darkest moment. Then there's that verse again, Romans 8, 28. We know all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. In my rearview mirror, 
I see now that God used this situation to answer my prayer, but I continued to harbor unforgiveness for these two men for all these years, and I couldn't forgive myself for having those murderous thoughts. Shame and condemnation flooded my thoughts any time that that memory surfaced, torpedoing the foundation of my Christian character. So fast forward to civilian life with marriage and family, baggage of past hurts holding onto a victim's mentality, using negative coping mechanisms, years of damage started coming to a head. That's a lot of backstory. So here we are again, back at the beginning of my testimony. My wife has caught me with pornography yet again. Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Check out the message translation of those verses. Frauds. You're like manicured graves, grass clipped and flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. May work for Gandalf and Frodo, but it wasn't working for me. Sure, my sins were kept secret. I'd sin and confess, wash, rinse, repeat, thinking it was just between me and God, but it really wasn't. I was leaving a door open for Satan's attacks across all of my relationships. I carried it into my marriage with my relationship with my wife, with my relationship with my kids. It spilled over into work and how I treated my coworkers. It even impacted how I led the volunteers of my own home church's production team. I needed help, and I was finally willing to seek it. I started seeing a Christian counselor. I discovered that I was placing self-gratification as an idol over God. This idolatry was not porn or sex, but actually placing myself first. My feelings, my satisfaction, all more important than God's plan for my life. My counselor encouraged me to find a Christ-based 12-step program. A friend encouraged me to attend Recovery Alive and join his process group. Friday, June 4th, 2021, I attended my first RA power group and people group. Monday, June 7th, I started my first process group. I'm sure the worship was great, and John had an inspiring message that Friday night. What I really remember was the man that simply stepped on stage to share the announcements. He introduced himself, a faithful believer in Jesus Christ who struggled with pornography and— wait a minute, what? Did he just say pornography? Did he just admit out loud in a room full of people— and broadcasting online? If he could admit that out loud to so many people that maybe I was in the right place. I found people just like me who had the same struggles just like me. Hope and victory in Jesus, which is what I needed. And Jesus met me here. I kept coming back. When I started working the process, I prayerfully told God what he was going to fix in me. He was going to cure me of my porn issue and reconcile my marriage. I still wrestled for control. I was telling the master healer how he was going to heal me. Imagine me on an operating table, dictating instructions to a heart surgeon on how he would remove the sin cancer in my heart. Well, God had other plans. Remember that verse in Jeremiah 17 again, verse 9? The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. There's more. Verse 10 says, But God, but I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. Like a good submarine sailor, below the surface, getting to the root of things, God exposed the bitterness that I had been harboring against him. All these years, I'd been blaming God for circumstances he was using to shape my life. Then it happened. On a RA Friday night in August 2021, I let go. I released the white knuckle, knuckle grip I had in my chair and walked up front. I left fear at the altar right there. I stopped being afraid of what other people might think of me in recovery. Then it happened again. In September 2021, 
God took away my shame and condemnation. I left it at the altar right there. (laughs) Satan was disarmed. He couldn't use the memories of my sin against me anymore. If Jesus forgave me, I could forgive myself, and I did. I found the freedom mentioned in John 8, 36. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Remember Matthew 23, 27? I was concealing my sin in a whitewashed tomb. Didn't we just celebrate Easter? I had been living my life like my sins were buried in that grave with Jesus, but not celebrating the new life and hope that Jesus brings through his resurrection. I'd been refusing to leave that tomb. The stone had been rolled away, but I stayed in that cold, dark cave, refusing to stand in the light of Christ's love and grace. For years, y'all, I was living in a self-imposed prison of shame and condemnation. I'd not been able to forgive myself, even though Christ had forgiven me, even though I knew that Jesus lived in my heart and I was a Christian. No wonder I had been struggling to forgive others and harboring bitterness towards God. But I was finally free. God delivered me from self-hate, and I forgave myself. I forgave those two sailors and other bullies for persecuting me. And I realized I released my bitterness towards God. There's that song again, Evidence. See the cross, see the empty grave, see the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, O Jesus. So why should I fear? The evidence is here. Why should I fear? Well, actually, there was more to fear, to overcome. How would my wife react to reading my letter of amends to her? My wife is very gracious and forgiving, but before writing my letter of amends, we had to have some very serious conversations. Have you ever come back from RA or your process group and get the look, you know, from your spouse? A look like, did you actually learn something this time? Are these steps really going to work this time? So in those conversations, it was important for me to understand what her expectations were with my recovery. But it wasn't about people-pleasing this time or placating her in any, in any way. This was for my spiritual health and healing and for the health of our marriage. She was invested in my recovery too. She had the right to know what, how I was doing without revealing too much too soon and certainly protecting the confidentiality from my group. Humbly and out of respect for our marriage and my commitment to her, I shared how God was using RA's 12 steps to work on me and I would be writing a letter of amends to her. Finishing my process group, I did write that letter and read it to her, is one of the scariest things I've ever done. And I finally, my chains of past sin and regret were broken. I left fear, shame, and condemnation at the altar. I learned to forgive myself and let go of legalism and perfectionism. I no longer expect perfection from others. I encourage excellence but show more grace, becoming a better leader at work and at my own home church's tech team. God showed me that I was harboring bitterness towards him, and he forgave me. I've reconciled with my wife the hurts I brought into our family, and we've had the best relationship now that we've had in our 30 years of marriage. Praise the Lord. I've forgiven people who've hurt me, and I've asked forgiveness of people who I have hurt. I'm working on restoring other relationships with family and friends, and I'm pursuing the sanctification that comes from a closer relationship with Christ. I still struggle with self-worth wounds, but I turn to God more and use healthy coping mechanisms instead of porn, escapism, and isolation to fill the void. And I won't quit until my final miracle happens. God used more than just process groups. He used Christian counseling, books like The Bondage Breaker by Neil T. Anderson and Surfing for God by Michael John Cusick. There's my balcony people cheering me from the sidelines, encouraging me and praying for me, and I see some of them in the audience right now. I set boundaries like installing Covenant Eyes software on all devices. I join community groups and men's accountability groups. I have accountability partners that help keep me honest with myself and check in. I start each day with devotions, Bible study, and prayer, and I adopted gratefulness and journaling recommended by the RA Handbook. Attending Reboot Trauma and Reboot Military classes were also instrumental. The program helped define the psychological trauma and brokenness that came from my U.S. Navy service. It connected me to a network of spiritual brothers in arms, sharing similar experiences and see God heal, heal some of their and my mental 
wounds. We just started meeting again, by the way, right here in trailer one on Monday nights at 7 p.m. If you want to join us, you're welcome. Again, more evidence looking back through my spiritual review mirror to see God working all things for his good. I keep coming back, not just attending RA, but I serve on their production team too. Volunteering helps keep me accountable to regular attendance on Friday nights, and it helps, helps me give back. Serving on the production team, leading process groups, and today's testimony, God may use me yet to impact someone else's recovery, just like many of you have affected mine. This may be the end of my time, but it's not the end of my story. I will continue to work the process in future process groups and reboot groups and let God's healing into my life. So take my advice. Don't wait years to pursue God's healing for you. What's holding you back? Who do you need to make amends with? Do you owe God an amends? The altar is open. There's a new process group starting. Sign up. Do it right now. Jesus is waiting for you. Thank you for letting me share. Amen. You can stay standing. and Can we give Jim another hand? Amen. Thank you, Jim. So if you could do this for me and... Um, just close your eyes and bow your heads and I, I just want to calibrate our uh, our thoughts kind of filter them and focus them into a place of truth so I just want you to just kind of close your eyes and, and, and just hear me open your heart to this idea this thought and it's this, is that when we ask, do you owe God an amends? What we're saying is, and we've all experienced this as believers, and we know it's true, it's sometimes hard to believe. But when we ask God to forgive us our sins, and we take ownership of what we've done, He doesn't want something from us in that situation. He wants something for us. He's not doing that, insisting upon our repentance and insisting on us going to him and saying, God, I, I want to take ownership so he can punish us or make us feel ashamed and all that stuff. It's because he knows our sin and our struggle is keeping us from our best life. It's true. You could have freedom today. You could have life everlasting and life in abundance today. But there is one major hurdle. Owning your stuff. And that hurdle often is not attempted because you think you'll just get the snot beat out of you. If you own it, you'll lose your power. If you own it, the secret's out, and people will ridicule you, and God will look down his nose at you and hurl that rock. Remember, he doesn't have a rock in his hand. And so if you think about it, this, this Wednesday during a typical lunch meeting, all of heaven is waiting and this is what I really want you to hear me say. When one, this is what the Bible says, when one sinner comes to repentance, the Bible says every angel in heaven has a party. They celebrate. They celebrate for you. They celebrate the lost sheep being found. They celebrate that coin that was lost, being picked up and 
and, and being cherished and, and celebrated. They celebrate the, the prodigal daughter and son coming home and they throw the robe around you and put the ring on your finger and the father says, my son, my daughter who is lost is found, has come home, let's kill the fatted calf, let's have a party. That's what's waiting today, believe it, on a Wednesday during lunch. That the heavens are going to go nuts with rejoicing right now because you say, I want to take ownership of my part. What's your part? You're blaming other people. You're looking around and you're mad at everybody. Or you're so full of shame and condemnation and you just ignore it because, man, you just don't want to get buried in that stuff. But what is your side of the street today? You're in a relationship struggle. It's time to own your part. You've been sinning, relapsed in addiction, or pornography, or you're angry. Oh, man, you're so angry. And you lash out, and people around you are saying stuff to you. And you just... You're just white knuckling it and you're pretending there's something in your life it's time to just give it to Jesus and say I, I want to own this and I, I need you to take it from me because I can't do it myself if there's something in your life right now you say I got to own this I got to own it I'm praying the Holy Spirit is just leading you to have that moment where he shows you you're doing some self examination he's searching your heart and there's that thing you're gossiping you're ungrateful, you're bitter, you're, you're going after people, you're, 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 you're miserable at work, and you're, whatever it is, God is just saying, man, I need you to own your side of this thing. But you know, the way he treats me, no, no, but what's your part? What part are you playing? Well, life's so hard, I don't have any other way to cope. Yeah, that's fine, but own it. We'll figure that out. God's got you. So every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around right now. You're online, you're here, and there's something. you got to own it. Today, you confess it and say, yes, this is my struggle, and I need a Savior. I need, it. I need to confess it. I need to own it. I need to say, God, I owe you an amends. I've hurt you in what I've done, and, I, and I'm ready to just own it. That thing is in your head right now. Nobody else looking around. Just shoot your hand up. Say, yep, I got it. There's something in my life. I want to just, I want to own it. I want to own it. I want to own it. I want to make some amends today to God. There's something I'm struggling with, secret sin, a struggle, yeah. If you raise your hand or even if you did and you just want to come and, and get right with God, you want to just put this at the altar, this thing that you're working through, and you just say, God, I haven't owned this thing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to just own it and, and come clean. Just come right now to the altar and just spend some time here at the altar and saying, God, I'm ready to own it. I'm ready to make my amends with you. I'm ready to say, man, this is mine. I'm, I'm willing to take responsibility and let you clean me because your word says that when I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Do you want to be clean? Do you want to be free? Do you want to walk out of here with that baggage off of you and just say, I, want, I just want to be new. I, I don't want to come... And then leave with the same baggage, man. I want to drop this stuff off. I don't want to leave here the same as I walked in here. Just come on. Come to the altar. I want to pray over you. We're going to sing a little bit. And let's just dump this stuff. Because I see the evidence of his goodness all over your life. And this is keeping you from everything God has for you. So come on. Let's get free together. And all this pain. I wonder if I'll ever find my way I wonder if my life could really change at all And all this earth Could all that is lost ever Found. Could a garden come up from this ground at all? You make beautiful things, you make beautiful.
fall things out of the dice You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of ice And all around Hope is springing up from this old ground out of chaos life is being found in you God cause you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of the dust you Beautiful things you make beautiful things out of us. Oh, you make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of us oh, yeah. making it right God you make me new you are making me things on purpose out of our pain he is so good if you embrace it we had a little staff meeting today with our recovery life folks and I mentioned John chapter 9 it's just on my heart I can't get out of it it's the man who's born blind he's born blind and the disciples are like well who whose fault is this did the parents sin or did the guy sin who's blind to cause it? And Jesus says, no, 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 neither. So this occurred so the father could have glory. That's a hard, I mean, we're excited here because I think we get it in recovery a little bit, but that's a hard thing to kind of wrap our heads around. But if we can, if we can believe that all these things that are so painful and difficult can be redeemed, that they serve a purpose, that there's something bigger, there's a bigger plan, then we can surrender to that plan and be excited about being a part of the plan. That there's a bigger picture. And either we're going to serve that bigger picture or try to force that big picture to serve us, and it won't work. That's very, very... <laughs> Dead end street, man. It's selfish. Let God's purpose be served in you through a greater purpose. So many people. Jim, thank you, man. You touched a lot of people in here. Amen. <laughs> Just real quick, I'm gonna say this Friday too. I was in a I was in a meeting in uh, 
in Texas thinking about this, and I shared it, about how um, Casey, when we were in Lynchburg, Virginia, he was sharing with some guys his testimony. And you may have heard him say this, but I don't know why it struck me so hard. Is He's sharing a story about how he had shot himself. And God rescued him, but the battle that he was in, and he got to the end of that story, and he looks at these guys that he's talking to, and he says, if God could take me all the way back to that place and say, you get a do-over, would you do something different? Would you do it all different? He says, I wouldn't change a thing. And I believed every word he was saying because of where that man is today. Amen? That God just works it out. And I think it's true with Jim, too. I mean, I think Jim... You don't want to go through it at the time, but I think the reason Jim is standing on this stage and inspiring other people is the hell that he went through, right? Would you change anything? I'm glad you said no, because it'd be really bad if you said, yeah, I'd be like, oh, crap. <laughs> I know we have regrets, I know, but what if all of this serves a greater purpose? Could we just, could we just believe it? No matter what hell you're going through, God's got a redemption story. He's writing through your pain. Amen? Let's go ahead and go to the serenity prayer and, and just accept this, this hardship as a pathway to peace. Amen. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time. Living hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so I can be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. God bless you guys. We do have people groups right after. Ladies are right back there in the connect room. Dudes.